Good morning, Riverside United Church. And welcome to worship today. My apologies that my printer wasn't working properly, so Margita saved the day so I could print my uh, worship service for this morning because I'm not good enough to memorize these things at this point in my life. Uh, maybe that will change in a few years. Um, but at this point, I print things off and use paper occasionally for that purpose so that we can enjoy worship together. But thank you for joining us this morning and to all of our viewers who are watching online, a special welcome to all of them as well. And if you're feeling comfortable and brave this morning, I'd invite you to turn around, give a wave to the camera, and welcome our online viewers today who join us on this bit chillier July morning. June morning. It's not July yet. Don't get ahead of myself. We still have Canada Day in the future. Um, th these glasses case, I think, is up here. It said lost and found. So if anybody is missing a somewhat blue-colored kind of snake-looking skin glasses case. Oh. You, right there? I'm not going to throw it. Did you play football wide receiver before? Because I didn't play quarterback, so that might not work very well. But perfect. We found the people that the lost and found belongs to. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, welcome. Last week, we did not gather here for worship. If you tried to come here, you would have come to a mostly empty building, I presume. Uh, but we gathered with, give or take, 300 other people at Guestwood with other local United Churches as we worshipped out at the beautiful Essex County and the wonderful uh, United Church camp out there called Guestwood. If you're able to join us, I hope you had a wonderful time and got to see some people you don't see all that often from other churches. And the weather was quite cooperative, wasn't it? It wasn't too hot. Yeah, it wasn't too cold. Give a hand to God for the weather that day. Although I heard it was raining early in the day or when they were setting up on Saturday. Uh, but I, they, we had a good big tent out there. So that was a great thing to be a part of. But we're going to sing our first song here this morning, and it comes from our Voices United hymn book, number 674, Fight the Good Fight. So I'd invite you to please stand as you're able and join us in singing. seated <clears throat> as we come into our uh, opening prayer which will include our Lord's prayer so please join me as appropriate let us pray <clears throat> God we thank you for the uh, buzzing bees and the budding flowers and the fruit trees that are bearing fruit 
We thank you, Lord, for all those who are gathered here, wherever they might be, whether here in person or watching online. We pray, Lord, that you're, you will bless us during this worship service, that your presence, God, will be here among us and within us, that our hearts may be open to your stirrings this morning, that we may be open, God, to the challenges in our lives, and that way may, we may reach out to others in peace, faith, and love as we seek to know Christ and make him known. Jesus taught us a lot in his life, and one thing he taught us is how to pray. And so we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Is my mic okay, Luke? I wasn't sure if there's a low battery sign on the clicker down here or not. So the last couple of weeks that we've been here at Riverside for worship, we've gone through some readings that are following the people of Israel and their demand for a king. Saul becomes that king, but Saul, we come to find out, has heart issues, and eventually David is chosen to replace him. We continue reading that narrative this week, actually, and we will continue through the month of July as well, following this narrative of, of the life of David, essentially, and the beginning stages, anyways, of him becoming the king of Israel. These, I think, are important stories in the history of our faith, and I hope that they can continue to speak to us today, even roughly 3,000 years later, that they may help us understand a little bit more about our faith, about our life, and how life and faith in the world today, 3,000 years later, still intersect and still are influenced by these stories. For now, though, we've got another song to sing, so I'd invite you to please stand as you're able in singing, Lord, I lift your name on high.
Are we trying? Sandy, would you shut the mic off on the front of you, please? This one? No, no, Sandra. Just shut the mic off. Oh, sh shut that mic off. That's not it. It's one of the largest ones. What's church if you don't have a little fun with it sometimes, <laughs> right? Now, usually we'd invite our children forward, um, but there aren't any, as it's summertime, and we don't have Sunday school or anything this week. Well, sorry, Lucas. Lucas is here. We do have one young at heart here. I include myself in the young at heart still, for what it's worth. Um, but we should bring our offering baskets forward. So I'll help Lori with that, who's helping me with it as well. I guess they're more of a plate than a basket. Oh. And so we bring this offering forward just to give it to God, a sign and symbol of all that we give back to God for all that God has given to us. So I don't think we have a choir song this morning, do we? We don't have a soloist or anything. Oh no, Glenna, yes, Glenna and, um, my apologies, Glenna and Margit are doing something together. So we do have a song, but it's not one that's being sung. Good morning. So Margit and I, for our Ministry of Music this morning, are going to play All Creatures of Our God and King. This expression of praise, found in nearly every hymnal, was originally written in 1225 by Giovanni Bernardone, who was better known as St. Francis of Assisi. He was a mystic, medieval monk who spent his life as an itinerant evangelist, preaching and helping the poor people of Italy. St. Francis was born in 1182 in Assisi, Italy. After an early indulgent life as a soldier, he reformed his ways at the age of 25. He became determined to serve God by imitating the selfless life of Christ in all that he did. He scorned the possession of material goods, denounced his inherited wealth, denied himself everything but the most meager of necessities, and devoted himself completely to moving about as Christ's representative. At the age of 28, he founded the Franciscan Order of Friars, which became a large movement of young men and women who adopted his religious beliefs and lifestyle. He was known as a great lover of nature, seeing the hand of God in all creation. All Creatures of Our God and King is said to have been written one hot summer day in 1225, one year before his death. Throughout his life, St. Francis made use of singing and believed strongly in the importance of church music. This beautiful expression of praise is one that has survived the passing of several hundred years. And I would like to share with you some of the imagery in the poem. Bright burning sun with golden beam, soft shining moon with silver gleam, the flowers and fruits that verdant grow, let them God's glory show. O oh, rushing wind and breezes soft, on clouds that ride the winds aloft, let all things their creator bless and worship God in humbleness.
My turn, Andrew. Oh, yes. Arlene's turn. We have a surprise. Now that we have the microphones all working. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I have the pleasure, she's going to grump at me, but I have the pleasure to say something about our Ministry of Music, Glenna. Just give me that look. Um, there was a contest, and it was a contest, I believe it was a province hall? No, Ontario and Alberta. Ontario and Alberta. And 186 they, people. How many? 186 people were nominated. Or 197, I don't know. It was a lot. A little under 200 <laughs> were nominated. And um, the season's winner was Glenna. And we are thrilled. And the title was Season Celebrate Remarkable Residents. And we know how remarkable she is. She's wonderful. Not only does she win a prize, but she gets and has $10,000 charity donation to the charity of her choice, and it's going to the Leon Resident for Women. Cape Hunter started. That Cape Hunter started. So they are receiving a $10,000 charity donation, $10,000. Really proud of you, and uh, <clears throat> you should be proud of all the work that you do, the things that you do, and the person that you are. Because we certainly are very proud of you. You make a difference to many, many lives, many you don't know about. So thank you from all of us. Thank you for making a difference. <laughs> I don't get to do it. I know. That's why we did it after. <laughs> right. I still have the post we can get through. Uh, that's okay, you can sit for a few minutes. But thank you for making a difference. A little bit of sunshine. Okay. I just want to say one thing. If you want to know my story, uh, it's on Facebook, under the Seasons Communities Facebook page. So, if you want, you're welcome to look at it. And this has really meant a lot to me. I've been involved with Leon Residents for probably 30 years now, so in order to be able to give them $10,000 is just beyond any feelings that I have. I believe it is time for our first scripture reading this morning. Jim, are you reading today? It's actually the reading they read last week at uh, Guestwood Camp as well that George preached on. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Although Arlene, you said she can sit for a few minutes. I'm not sure who you think is preaching, but it's going to be a bit longer than just a few minutes. <laughs> go ahead. Reading, yeah, no, you read. Go ahead. You're good now. I'm, I'm going to be less than a few minutes. Jim will be less than a few minutes. Good morning. Uh, this is from Mark 4, paragraphs 35 to 41. That evening, whoa, that evening, Jesus said to his follow, followers, let's go across the lake. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him in the boat just as he was. There was also other boats with them. A very strong wind came up the lake. The waves came over the sides and into the boat so that it was already full of water. Jesus was at the back of the boat, sleeping with his head on a cushion. His followers woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care that we are drowning? Jesus stood up and commanded the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind stopped and it became completely calm. Jesus said to his followers, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The followers were very afraid and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Thank you. So I put together a little something that I want to start with this morning, if we're ready for that there, Luke. I'll let you guys get to it and start it for us. Just a little bit of fun this morning as we begin worship. I'm going to read it as well, if you can keep my mic on, just for anybody that either can't read or can't see the screen. Uh, but you should be able to 
hear some of the music as well. You, it may be familiar. It says the people of Israel defeating giants, David and Goliath. The nation of Israel was at war with the Philistines despite the best efforts of past great warriors like Samson and other Israelite leaders and judges. The Philistines are still the greatest enemy of the people of Israel. They have brought their vast and powerful army to the edges of the nation, bringing nothing but bad news and warfare with them. Instead of a large battle with lots of bloodshed, though, the Philistines send out a single warrior, the greatest warrior they've ever known. His name is Goliath. He's a giant of his day, powerful, strong, and protected by some of the best armor and weapons known. Goliath challenges the armies of Israel to send out their best fighter, and whoever wins that fight will also win the war. The fate of the nation is up in the air, as the armies of Israel are intimidated and fearful of this giant and none wished to challenge him until a small, tanned, and handsome shepherd boy by the name of David comes along. That should have kept playing a little bit longer. <laughs> we skipped a part of it. All right. Are you familiar with Veggie Tales? Anybody remember Veggie Tales? So I pulled the clip of the David and Goliath Veggie Tales. It's called Dave and the Big Pickle, or Dave and the Giant Pickle. And it's just like a short one-minute clip where Junior Asparagus, or Dave, slings his swing shot and hits the giant pickle, Goliath, and he falls and is defeated. So that's, we're, we're looking at David and Goliath today. We'll get to that reading in a moment. This is a classic story of the small, insignificant, non-powerful person overcoming and defeating the much larger, stronger, and significantly more powerful army, hence kind of the Star Wars intro and music, to get us into the mood of Luke Skywalker, the small guy, defeating the big enemy ship that is destroying planets. Now many preachers and pastors and teachers over the years take this story and they turn it into a story about defeating the giants in your own life, whatever those giants might be, usually personal issues, things that you might struggle with that you can't defeat on your own, and so God helps you much the same way as God helped David defeat Goliath. I want to take a bit of a different approach this morning, but first let's start reading the narrative as First Samuel writes about this story, starting at verse 17, verses 1 to 11. And we see it say this. The Philistines gathered their armies for war. They met at Soko in Judah and camped at Ephes Damim between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites gathered in the valley of Elah and camped there and took their positions to fight the Philistines. The Philistines controlled one hill while the Israelites controlled another. The valley was between them. This isn't working. <laughs> I'll let you guys do that then. The Philistines had a champion fighter from Gath named Goliath. He was about nine feet four inches tall. He came out of the Philistine camp with a bronze helmet on his head and a coat of bronze armor that weighed about 125 pounds. He wore bronze protectors on his legs and he had a bronze spear on his back. The wooden part of his larger spear was like a weaver's rod and its blade weighed about 15 pounds. The officer who carried his shield walked in front of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the Israelite soldiers, Why have you taken positions for battle? I am a Philistine and you are Saul's servants. Choose a man and send him to fight me. If he can fight and kill me, we will be your servants. But if I can kill him, you will be our servants. And then he said, Today I stand and dare the army of Israel. Send one of your men to fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard the Philistines' words, they were very scared. We'll go to that in a, a second, too. Notice how well the writer and narrator describes Goliath here. Giant, nearly 10 feet tall, 
bronze helmet on his head, coat of bronze armor that weighs 125 pounds. But let's set the scene too, because there's this is the area. That, pull up that map now, sorry. A couple maps to help set the scene so we can have an idea of where this war is happening. So you can see, in, kind of in the middle of the map, you've got the Dead Sea to the right, or the west, or the east, sorry, and the Mediterranean Sea to the, east, to the west. It's right in the middle, you kind of see a bit of green, a little dry valley, a little, looks like maybe a riverbed. The Valley of Elah is connected to it. Right in the middle, you see the, the names of Soko and Azika, where the... Um, where they are camped, where this battle is happening in the Valley of Elah. If we want to go to the next, pull up that second map. And there's a closer map of the Valley of the Battle of Elah. The, the valley is a, a dry creek bed. You have the Israelite position to the north and the Philistine army position to the south. And of course, Goliath is described. He wears these bronze protectors on his legs. He has a bronze spear on his back. The actual spear itself has this wooden reaver's wad, rod that weighs 15 pounds by itself. An officer walks in front of Goliath and he carries Goliath's shield. Some pretty specific details about where this event is happening and who is involved. Here specifically Goliath. And I think these details are important. And they're important because they tell us that this Goliath, whatever kind of giant he is, is no ordinary person. He's no ordinary man, and so no ordinary person would ever be able to defeat him. I, by myself, would not stand a chance. The, anybody else in the army of Israel, by themselves, would not be able to defeat him. Hence, we're told they're scared every time he comes out and challenges them. He's heavily protected. No weapon can touch him. He's well armed, more than one weapon at his disposal. And these are big, giant weapons. Bronze armor that weighs 125 pounds. Let's keep reading that 1 Samuel, though, chapter 17, verses 12 to 14, verses 20 to 24, and verses 32 to 44. The story continues. Now David was the son of Jesse, an Ephrathite from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. In Saul's time, Jesse was an old man. His three oldest sons followed Saul to the war. The first son was Eliab, the second was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. David was the youngest. Jesse's three oldest sons followed Saul. Early in the morning, David left the sheep with another shepherd. He took the food and left as Jesse had told him. When David arrived at the camp, the army was going out to their battle positions, shouting their war cry. The Israelites and Philistines were lining up their men to face each other in battle. <clears throat> David left the food with the man who kept the supplies, and he ran to the battle line to talk to his brothers. While he was talking with them, though, Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came out. He shouted things against Israel as usual, and David heard him. When the Israelites saw Goliath, they were very much afraid, and they ran away. So David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged. I, your servant, will go and fight this Philistine. Saul answered, you can't go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. Goliath has been a warrior since he was a young man. But David said to Saul, I, your servant, have been keeping my father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and took a sheep from the flock, I would chase it. I would attack it and save the sheep from its mouth. When it attacked me, I caught it by its fur and hit it and killed it. I, your servant, have both killed a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like them, because he has spoken against the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from a lion and a bear will also save me from this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul put on his clothes on David. He put a bronze helmet on his head and dressed him in armor. David put on Saul's sword and tried to walk around, but he was not used to the armor Saul had put on him. And so he said to Saul, I can't go in this because I'm not used to it. David took it all off. He took his stick in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from a stream. He put them in his shepherd's bag and grabbed his sling and he went to meet the Philistine. And at the same time the Philistine was coming closer to David, the man who held his shield walked in front of him. 
When Goliath looked at David and saw that he was only a boy, tanned and handsome, he looked down on David with disgust. And he said, Do you think I am a dog that you can come at me with a stick? And he used his God's name to curse David. And he said to David, Come here, I'll feed your body to the birds of the air and the wild animals. So in comes David to save the day. You can go ahead, I think, one more slide. He's a son of Jesse whose brothers are fighting in King Saul's army. David, of course, is no warrior. He's not like his brothers. But notice what Goliath begins with in all of these instances, all these battles. Goliath begins with intimidation. Goliath begins with what we might call today psychological warfare. Not only is he a giant of a man that towers over everybody else, but he's got the mouth to go along with it. He's got the big mouth as well to try and strike fear into anybody that might challenge him with not only his size, but his words as well. And it's fear which goes straight to the heart of the whole army of Israel. Even the king of Israel, Saul, we're told, is scared. This scene has happened, we're told, for 40 days. Tell me if you haven't heard the number 40 in the Bible before. 40 days, this Philistine giant named Goliath comes out and he challenges the Israelite armies to send out one warrior. Send out one guy for hand-to-hand -hand combat. If he wins, then we will be defeated by you. But if we win, if I win, then you will be defeated by us. Nobody steps up every single day. Nobody wants to be the bearer of this burden. David, though, sees this scene and he goes to Saul and he says, you know what, I can do this. Just this young, let, let's assume he's 13, maybe about yay tall. Young, handsome, tanned boy. 13 seems fairly young, so we'll go with 13. David isn't scared. You can almost imagine, I certainly can imagine Saul's bewilderment that like this little boy, this little shepherd boy that's never fought a fight in his life against a person will raise himself up to defeat this giant, Goliath. Really? <laughs> I don't think so. I can imagine that might have been Saul's response to that. You can't go against that Philistine, you're only a boy. Goliath has been a warrior for many years. David defends himself, though, and he talks about his past as a shepherd. You know what, though, Saul, King Saul? I've kept my father's sheep safe for years. If a lion or bear came, I would chase it away. I'd take the sheep out of its mouth, and if it attacked me, I'd grab it, I'd hit it, and I'd kill it, too. Much bigger, more fearsome animal than me. This Philistine warrior, he'll be the same as that sh those, those bears and those lions that I've defended my sheep from before. Because he's spoken against the armies of the living God. David believes that no matter what, since the Lord saved him from lions and bears, that the Lord will also surely save him from this Philistine as well. And of course, David's no ordinary boy, as we come to find out through the narrative of this story. He's been called by God at this point to be the next king, to follow in Saul's footsteps. Not that Saul knows these details right now, but David certainly has. He's been blessed by Eli. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Goliath is no ordinary person. He can't be defeated by any ordinary man. Good thing David's not any ordinary person. Saul gives David the go-ahead, but tries to put his armor on him. David's like, no, 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 I can't wear that. I'm not used to it. So he just goes to the stream with his sling, and he gets five smooth stones. Just five smooth stones. Now remember how Goliath is described, this fearsome warrior that stands nearly ten feet tall with the best armor, the west, best weapons, and even has somebody to carry his shield to protect him further so that he's not burdened by the shield. Somebody else carries it for him. Once again, the scene seems rather comical, if you might go ahead, the slide once, guys, up there. As David, the small, tanned, handsome boy, or Junior, the asparagus. Back one more now. You had it right with the asparagus. He was there. I saw him. No, you need to go back slides, not forward. 
Do we need to charge this? I don't know. Keep going. We want that asparagus back on the screen. Keep going. There we go. Junior the asparagus. A.K.A. Dave. Fighting the giant Goliath. Goes towards the gigantic warrior that every other soldier of Israel is afraid of. Goliath looks and he sees David in the distance. He sees that David is just a small, tanned, handsome boy. And he looks down on him with disgust. He curses David. He threatens him as he threatened the armies of Israel for 40 days straight. Right away, what does Goliath do? Psychological warfare. He tries to get into his head. He tries to put fear into David's head and heart. Only problem is that this time it doesn't work. Not on David, because he's no ordinary boy. But let's finish the reading this morning to verse uh, 45 to 51. But David said to him, You come at me using a sword and two spears, but I come to you in the name of the Lord All-Powerful, the God of the armies of Israel. You have spoken against him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll kill you and cut off your head. Today I'll feed the body of the Philistine soldiers to the birds of the air and the wild animals. Then all the world will know there is a God in Israel. Everyone gathered here will know the Lord does not need swords or spears to save people, for the battle belongs to him, and he will hand you over to us. As Goliath came near him to attack, David ran quickly to meet him. He took a stone from his bag and put it in his sling, and he slung it. The stone hit the Philistine, and he went down deep into his forehead, and Goliath fell face down on the ground. So David defeated the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. He hit him and killed him. He did not even have a sword in his hand. Then David ran and stood beside him. He took Goliath's sword out of his holder and killed him by cutting off his head. Funny enough, we leave that part of the story out of the Sunday school lesson. There might be a reason why. Goliath might have a mighty sword and two great spears and the best armor around, but David has the creator of the universe at his side, the creator of everything within it. David has the God of heavens and the earth on his side. David yells back at Goliath. He yells all this to him. He tries to turn the tide. So notice what David does. He also goes psychological warfare. You think you can beat me with your words? Let me tell you about words. Let me tell you about the, this living God that I am defended by. Your gods are nothing compared to him. He tries to put the same doubt into Goliath. The same psychological warfare route. David's honest, though, as well with Goliath and his plans. He tells him exactly what's going to happen. He doesn't need swords and spears to save his people. God has something else. God has David. The battle between them commences, but, and this is where it's important, I think, it's not hand-to-hand -hand combat which is what Goliath called for, what Goliath hoped for, because he knew nobody would stand a chance. Instead, David takes a sling from a distance and essentially shoots him with this rock right in the forehead. Goliath falls down, face down on the ground. He's been defeated. David then does what he says he was going to do, and he cuts off Goliath's head with Goliath's own sword. The sword that Goliath had previously alluded to in this story, being one of his strengths, becomes his downfall. Sometimes, I think in our lives as well, our greatest strengths will become our biggest downfalls. Good to keep that in mind sometimes. David's a bold young boy who places his trust fully in God. That kind of truth, that kind of faith, that kind of trust can often look odd to those who don't have the same faith and trust themselves. They don't understand it. They don't necessarily appreciate it. They might call you crazy or stupid or uneducated for believing such stories as this. If so, guess what? You're in good company. Because everybody probably thought David was out of his mind. You're crazy, David. You're just a small boy. You can't take on this giant. That's not possible. You don't stand a chance. I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> many preachers and teachers and, and pastors, they take this story 
and they, turn, and they talk about how because David defeated this giant, Goliath, we too, with God at our side, can do the same thing. We can defeat the giants in our own lives, whatever those giants might be. But that's not the message I want you to understand this morning, though it's a good one, and I think it's an important one. The lesson I want us to really get out of this is that the smallest set of skills, the smallest set of skills can help you save people. Whatever you're good at can help somebody. No matter how small you think you are, no matter how small of a skill you think you have, God can use it and blow it up into something magnificent. It's the same with this church. No matter how small and insignificant we might be compared to other churches in Windsor, we can do great things with God at our side. You can make a huge difference in somebody's life using what you already have at your disposal, using things you already know. David wasn't a great warrior. He didn't have armor. He didn't have a sword. He had a very small skill set, <laughs> a lit literal rock, small, smooth stones. It's a very small skill, but he uses it to powerful, incredible conclusions. He saves an entire army, the whole nation of Israel. We can do that too, with all the small skills we have, whatever they might be. You can do it with your big skills as well, for sure. But your skills matter. What you know matters. What you do matters just as much as David in this story. Because it's not by our power that we do these things. It wasn't by David's power that he defeated Goliath. It was by the power of God. It was by the power of who David calls the living God, the breathing God, the God of the whole universe, the creator of everything. And there's a challenge here as well, though, I think, with this story. Because when we read this story, much like other stories in the Bible, we always see ourselves as the hero, don't we? When we read this story, we see ourselves as David. The person defeating giants. The person using a small skill set to do something wonderful with. And so like David, we often see ourselves in his shoes. We're the small, insignificant, non-powerful person who has to overcome incredible odds to go up against something much larger, much stronger, much more significantly powerful than we are. But the question I want you to think about today and, and this week as you go through your lives, where do we act like Goliath? Where are we somebody's Goliath talking down to them, using our power to knock them down a few pegs, using our influence to hurt others, using our words to talk down to others to gain the upper hand? Where in our lives or even in this church community do we challenge anybody who dares to come against us? We like to believe when we read the Bible that we're always the hero. We're always the hero. But when in our lives are we the villain or the anti-hero? When are we Goliath instead of David? When are we Judas instead of Peter? Because I know I've had those experiences in my life too. I don't like to admit it. <laughs> to be fair, but it happens. When are we the one using our power and influence to gain an upper hand? David and Goliath is this wonderful story about God's grace and God's power in our lives, helping us see that nothing is impossible with God. No matter the skills you have, whether small or large, God can blow them up into something that you could never dream of. But that starts, it truly starts, I think, by recognizing the times and places when we're not the David in the story, but we are the Goliath. We're the ones causing the harm. We're the ones causing the hurt. But by God's power, we can overcome that as well. And amen to that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, as David lifted your name high above this giant warrior named Goliath. We lift your name high in worship today, God. And we pray, Lord, that all that we do 
be done for you, God, in your glory as we seek your guidance in our lives, as you call us to make a difference in the world, to forgive others, God, as we have been forgiven, and to love others, God, the way that you, Lord, love us. The story of David and Goliath is a great story about overcoming incredible odds because of your power, Lord, and your influence in our lives. But help remind us, God, of those times where we're actually Goliath in this story, not David. Remind us of those times when we speak down to others, when we use our power to try and influence people, when we think, God, that we know better than you. Lord, send us your Holy Spirit to stir our hearts in this moment. Remind us to take a step back, to apologize as necessary, and to find ways, God, as our creed says, to reconcile and make new, the United Church New Creed. We lift up in prayer, God, all those who are sick and hurting, all those in hospitals and long-term care homes. We pray especially for Brett, Christine, Gail, Linda, John, Jeff, Jean, Eleonora, and Ed. We also lift up in prayer all those among us, God, who are hurting from the loss of friends or family, the death of friends or family, and for all those who have died and gone before us, Lord, may we know that they are in the, your trusting care in the fold of your arms, ready to spend eternity with you and wait, waiting for us. But until our time comes, Lord, may we use our time here on earth to spread your word, to spread your love, that all the world around us may know your grace and mercy and love for them, as we know your grace and mercy and love for us. And we pray all this, God, and so much more in the name of Christ our Lord. And everybody said, Amen. So we're going to sing our final song for this morning from the Voices United hymn book number 660, How Firm a Foundation. So I'd invite you to please stand as you're able and join us in singing.
couple quick announcements for this morning. Our email and prayer list is always open. If you want to be added to either one, let us know. Our Faith Sunday sometime in the fall. If you're looking to reaffirm your faith or be baptized or make a, a declaration, a public declaration or transfer membership, anything like that, just let me know so we can get in contact to plan that time together. Um, anything else from the community? Anything I might have missed? Do we still have treats downstairs in the summer? Coffee downstairs? Yes. Yes, okay. Coffee treats downstairs. Malcolm. Jan Rankin's being a little bit of a memorial next Saturday. Oh, yes. That isn't your news for the pews, but Jan Rankin's celebration of life um, will is next Saturday yep. um, at the Riverside Sportsman Club or something like that. Yeah, so um, look for the in your news for the pews. All the details are in there. Grab a couple copies on your way out if you need to. If you need us to photocopy some, we can probably do that as well. Um, anything else? Thank you for that, Malcolm. Here and nothing. It's been wonderful to be able to connect with all of you and worship with all of you this morning. And I do hope you go from this time of worship wherever you might be, knowing that we in the church love you, knowing that God loves you. So go and serve others. Mm -hmm.